guys, thank you for being so patient and tuning in with us to talk to Kaylee about Awake and Walking ICU. She started out as a new grad in the ICU and is now a nurse practitioner there. So Kaylee, just introduce yourself. I'm Kaylee Dayton. I worked in the Awake and Walk in ICU for two years. Totally thought that was normal to have patients awake, engaging, cruising on the ventilators. And then I worked as a nurse practitioner or as a travel nurse around the country and had a lot of different experiences. I came back to Utah, back to the Wake and Walk and ICU during grad school, and now I've worked there as an NP for a few years. That's awesome. So tell us the most inspiring story of your Awake and Walking ICU career. I don't know how to <laughs> rank them. There's just, as with anyone's career, especially in the medical field, um, where there are so many. Um, wow. Just recently, we had an exciting moment with um, a COVID patient, one of our first. Um, he came in, and this is during the initial wave when we were intubating everyone that required more than six liters nasal cannula. And so he was admitted, intubated, and he was awake and walking the ventilator for six days, just walking in his room, um, sitting in the chair all day, and then he hit that cytokine storm. And as a lot of us have seen, they go fast. And so he needed to be prone, couldn't tolerate being supine. But because he wasn't delirious yet, he could be lightly sedated. Um, and he was still cam negative, still able to turn himself for those first two days of proning. Um, and then his lungs got even worse and we needed to paralyze him and deeply sedated him. And he was paralyzed for two days and deeply sedated for a total of four, four days, four additional days. So he was prone for eight days. Um, and because he stayed so strong the six days prior to that, um, as soon as he could be supine, we had him sitting up again, still in high ventilator settings. But four days after that, he was extubated and eventually was able to walk himself out the doors and go home. And he just was on the podcast and um, reported that for his 70th birthday, about five or six weeks after discharge, he was out golfing. And so for someone that had been on a ventilator for three weeks, that was really reaffirming of what we do in the wake and I walk in ICU is to watch him get his life back even at 70 years old. Yeah, that's amazing. And I, I listened to that podcast and you mentioned that he was doing push-ups while prone in his bed intubated. And I'm just visualizing this and that just sounds <laughs> amazing. But at the same time for a nurse that's never experienced it, kind of scary. Um, so I'm addicted to your podcast now and that's super fun because it's I seriously have this new fire about what's coming in medicine. Why don't you tell us how the Awake and Walking ICU started? You mentioned that it's been around since the 90s. I had no idea. Yeah, I can't take any credit for the evolution of this process. Um, I give all the credit to my the pioneers of the, of the process, and one of them is Polly Bailey. She's also a nurse practitioner, but when she was a nurse in a shock trauma ICU, Back in the 90s, um, this was a, an era in which they were deeply, deeply sedating people with benzodiazepine drips like Ativan, paralyzing everybody. Um, and back in the day, they didn't have rehabilitation services, really. So she became the primary nurse. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but she followed that a certain patient throughout her ICU stay, even to home. And this patient was from her hometown, and she tells it better on the podcast. But in summary... She watched this young mother in her 30s spend about a year trying to be able to get up her own stairs. Her husband was doing the bedpan in the, in the bed with her. Wow. She was completely debilitated, mentally um, altered, severe cognitive deficits. But when in the ICU do we see people afterward, really? How do we know what happens to them? And that was really shocking to Polly. So... There's no, there was no research on it. Everything was new. And she went to her medical director and said, we are breaking people. We have to change this. Yeah. What if you let me keep people awake and keep them moving so they never get that weak? What would happen? And this doctor, Dr. Clemmer, who's on episode two, um, he was incredulous. He thought that was crazy talk, and yet he trusted nurses. He trusted their instinct, um, which I think is a lot more powerful than a lot of research. And he felt that same way. So he allowed Polly to experiment. So she started just in the shock trauma ICU trying to wake people up and mobilize them. And you'll have to listen to her episode, but it was a whole course and journey. But here we are 
30 years later, um, very well established in our culture in the Wake and Walk in ICU. And um, it's all because of one nurse with a vision and good instincts that dare to ask why, why not, what if, all those questions that lead us to all the advancements that we've made in our field. Um, she led the way and it's still going. That's amazing. And, you know, they say that it takes 10 years for things to catch on from one side of the country to the other. But I just don't know how many awake and walking ICUs there actually are. Do you? Uh, it's definitely a process. We have so much research. So this specific hospital, Polly, actually put out um, a study back in 2009 or 2007, 2007 okay. showing that walking patients on ventilators is safe and feasible. And that was groundbreaking at the time. Mm -hmm. And so then research started firing up about cognitive deficits, deficits post ICU PTSD, um, return to work rates for patients with ARDS. So research started looking more into what happens to these patients. So we started seeing more of the problem, um, but it wasn't until, I don't know, I, I want to say five to 10 years ago that we started looking more into what is the solution. So we have all these problems, we break people in the ICU, but how do we avoid those that harm? Yeah. So that's how the A to F bundle came to be. Dr. Wes Ely is, um, he was a delirium expert. So he saw the delirium effects of delirium. And then he started developing this process, a protocol and how to lighten sedation. Yeah. Now the wake and wake in ICU, kind of takes it to a new extreme where we don't start sedation on everyone, hardly anyone that's intubated. Okay. Um, we have certain thresholds like needing paralysis when being prone, open abdomen, severe toxicities, things like that. But most everyone that gets intubated is woken up right after intubation. But ADEF bundle is our process. So that is, start, or is the kind of the, the new trend. So I think a lot of ICUs are working towards that. But as we discussed in the podcast, there are a lot of cultural barriers, a lot of really hard things um, to be able to fully implement that, let alone go to the extreme of the wake and walk in ICU. Yeah, for sure. But so, we'll get there. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I love these baby steps. It's amazing. So kind of give us a visual picture of what exactly the awake and walking ICU is for those of us who've never experienced it. So now that I am a nurse practitioner, I'm working the day shift. So I personally come in at seven in the morning and for most part, lights are already on by eight or eight 30. The day shift nurse has taken over. And a lot of times they already have the patients, um, even on the ventilators up in the chairs, <laughs> waiting for physical therapy to come. Patients are watching TV. They're right on the boards. They're um, asking when, when are we going to walk? Um, and patients walk three times a day and debated or not, at varying distances, our ICU is a 200 foot um, kind of circle. Okay. So patients usually walk anywhere between 50 feet to 1000 feet, whatever they can do um, at that time. And it's just assumed that that's going to happen. So physical therapy helps with those walks the first two. So about like nine in the morning, 10 in the morning, and anywhere between one and four in the afternoon. And then about nine o'clock at night, everyone takes their last lap around the unit so that they're worn out and they're ready to get real sleep. And we even have a shower room where um, some patients on the ventilator are able to get extension tubing and get real showers, even on, while intubated. That's incredible. That is seriously, that's amazing. I, yeah, I can't picture that. That's so incredible. <laughs> it, it's what I would want. One of our podcast episodes, um, one of our survivors had ARDS and she was on the ventilator for 17 days. Um, and she talks about how therapeutic it was to get a shower. If I was on the ventilator for 17 days, I'm sorry, a shower cap is not going to cut it. No. Yet she was awake. She walked her, would walk herself to the shower. She was helping her daughter do homework. Um, wow. She had the worst gag I've ever seen. And yet it's pretty amazing to hear her say, no way I would ever want to be sedated. I mean, at the time I asked her because online people were asking me questions and all the same impressions that we get um, isn't inhumane. Aren't people going crazy on the ventilator? Do, wouldn't they want to be sedated? So I asked her, hey, would you rather be sedated right now? And she looked at me like, well, why would I need to be sedated? Then I met her on, an, I, later I saw her on an ARDS survivor page. I asked hundreds of survivors who had walked on a ventilator. 
And only one person electronically raised their hand and it ended up being her. Um, and she asked if we had a survivor page for our patients because she couldn't relate to these other ARDS survivors because all of their um, discussions were about the trauma, wow. the psychological trauma of the P and the PTSD from all the hallucinations and delirium they had mm -hmm. and the long rehabilitations they had and the weakness they had and the cognitive deficits they had. And she, after 17 days in the mental didn't have any of that because she was never delirious. She walked the whole time and she was able to go back to her, running her own business shortly after that. So she, so then I asked her again on the podcast, now in retrospect, you knew how miserable that was to be on the ventilator. What would you choose? And she said, I would never want to be sedated after hearing what these survivors went through. That's incredible. That's really neat. So when a patient is nearing that time of needing intubated. Sometimes we have, you know, that threshold when where you're thinking, okay, we're getting close. Of course, there's those moments where we're just going to intubate right now and we don't have time to chit chat about it. But let's talk about the ones where you have some warning. Right. What does that conversation look like with these patients and having that discussion, um, that informed discussion about how this is going to look? Because they don't have this preconceived notion that I need to be sedated. Like you and I, thought that maybe we would need to be sedated because that's what we're used to. They don't have that preconceived notion. So what does that conversation look like? Um, under normal circumstances, the family hopefully is in the room too. And we explain to them why they would, why they're going to need to be intubated. Maybe some guesses as far as how long it's going to be. But when we tell them um, you're going to wake up afterwards and it's going to be uncomfortable, but we're here for you. And many patients before you and after you have done this, and a lot of these patients, if they've been hanging out in the ICU, they've been seen in their doorway. They've been watching people yeah. cruising around on the ventilator. So they've had a visual for the most part of what that would look like. Yeah. No one is excited to be intubated, <laughs> um, but they're okay with it. I mean, they just, I don't, I don't know that anyone's ever said, no, please just knock me out. Um, I, yeah. I think they're, I, and I personally would rather have, be autonomous. So I think they're okay. They're like, okay, I'm going to work through this. You're going to keep me strong. My family's going to be here. Um, so yeah, people are pretty okay with it. And so after intubation, they wake up and they're confused from those drugs. But the yeah. great thing is that they're short acting. Um, you're not having to clear out days of propofol or weeks of propofol that's in the adipose tissue. Yeah. So they're able to wake up kind of have that quick confusion, but be reoriented. Hey, remember what we talked about 20, 30 minutes ago? Here we are. Yes, that tube is terrible. And then we even have like a mirror they can look at. Um, they can feel it. They can get used to it. We let them see the ventilator. And as they get their faculties back and they have a time to adjust with the ventilator, mm -hmm. they end up being pretty calm and cooperative and safe and even reliable 15 to an hour minutes to an hour later. Yeah. Um, and a lot of patients are able to be unrestrained. They protect their tubes. Um, I know that's a big concern about self extubations and self extubations happen when people are delirious. And so if we don't cause delirium with sedation. We have a much better chance of having patients help us keep them safe. So I just recently had a COVID patient. I passed by her room and the ventilator was alarming and I looked in and she had her hands like this and my heart stopped. I thought she was going to go for the tube, which it was really unexpected because she was not delirious. And we rushed in there and she said, and she said, no, I, I coughed so hard that the tubing came detached from the, my endotracheal tube. Yeah. And she was holding it together and she was still getting pressure from the ventilator, holding it together herself. Yeah. And so that demonstrated to me that Anyone in their right mind is not going to take out their lifeline. And that's what we see with our patients. For the most part, when they are clear and out of delirium, um, they're a lot more help to us than someone that's dead weight in the bed, cold, totally confused and thrashing. That's a good point. So what's that nurse to patient ratio? Um, so everyone um, should have two to one, two okay. patients to one nurse, unless there's a higher acuity. Um it is very rare that we have anyone three to one. And I think that's really important. Um, respiratory therapists are really important too in this process. Um, and they have four ventilated patients to one RT. Um, we share our physical and occupational therapists with the um, 
medical floor as well, but ICU is big priority. And so they, they are so good at working around our schedules and everyone jumps in together. Everyone knows that everyone's going to walk and everyone helps each other. It's, it's a pretty amazing orchestration. That's amazing. So give us a picture of what that looks like for these patients that are up and ambulating. What's that army look like that's around them when they're up and ambulating? Um, it completely depends on the patient's status and capacity. Yeah. So the goal is that if anyone walks into the ICU or or was able to walk in the hospital, they should never lose the capacity to walk. We take away their capacity to walk when we sedate them, immobilize them, and let them um, atrophy. I had a physical therapist call it dis disustrophy, right? If we don't use those muscles, we lose them. And that's when patients get to be dangerous fall risks. That's when it takes a lot of people and lifts and all these things to get even get them out of bed. Mm -hmm. So it ends up being easier on the staff and the patient ultimately if we walk them even shortly after they're intubated. So someone gets intubated um, and an hour or two later, it's it's the afternoon time we're rounding, we're, we're getting everyone up and it's their turn. So um, they never lose that capacity to walk. So you'll see in some of these pictures, you'll see people with maybe two on each side and someone pushing a wheelchair and someone pushing the ventilator. So that's four people. Okay. That's quite a bit for our patients. Sometimes it's just um, physical therapy, th physical therapy, a nurse, respiratory therapist. Okay. Depends on how stable and strong they are. And for the most part, if we do our job right, we can keep them strong. That's amazing. So when your parents, patients do experience panic or anxiety, what are your coping strategies that you use, um, drugs or, or otherwise? Yeah, that is such an important topic because we see a lot of um, anxiety and, and fear in the ICU, right? Um, I didn't know about sedation vacations be, um, until I became a travel nurse. And when I was taught how to do them, I saw that you just turn the propofol down just enough to see them flail all fours. And they are agitated. They're wild. They're yeah. going for the tube right away. They are scary. So when people say, there's no way my patients would keep their tubes in, there's no way I could handle someone like that all shift, um, I agree. If you have wild, delirious patients, it is a lot of work. And we see that. We get patients from other facilities coming in that have been sedated for a week, 10 days. It is so much work, and they are so much more anxious, agitated, mm -hmm. uncomfortable. But we have to step back and look at the cause. I think we assume, and justifiably so, it would make sense that it's just the endotracheal tube. It's just the ventilator. It's just their lungs. When in reality... If we understand patient perspective and what it is really like to be sedated, we understand that it is their delirium that is causing them to jump out of their skin. Um, and I think episode four on the podcast, I had asked survivors on a survivor page to leave a vo voicemail just saying what they experienced under sedation. I didn't give any cues. I didn't say hallucinations. I just said, what did you experience under sedation? But all they talked about were their tears. They thought they were being buried alive. They thought their kids were kidnapped. They thought they were um, being held captive and being stabbed to death. I mean, terrible things. So if you start to lighten up my sedation and the whole time for the last week straight, I thought my kids are, were kidnapped, there's no way you're going to keep me in that bed. Right. Yet we can prevent so much agitation, so much anxiety and trauma mm -hmm. if we never provoke the delirium with sedation. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, when people initially wake up from um, sedation, they're like, whoa, what's going on? But yeah. we can reassure them. We can remind them of what they know once they're oriented with their environment and they have their faculties, then they can cope. Um, no one loves the tube. But when they understand what it's for psychologically, they're so much better with it. Um, yeah, it can be really anxiety provoking to be stuck in a bed, staring at the same walls, um, having no control over your environment, being critically ill, feeling terrible. So things like walking. I've had patients beg and plead to walk because it helps them with their anxiety, just like, you know, anyone that goes on a run or exercises to help with their right. mental health. Same concept. Um just the discomfort, those hospital beds are not comfortable. So sitting up in a chair, being able to reposition themselves, writing on a board, giving them their voice, helping them 
have their answers heard or their questions heard and answered. Um, communicating with their family. Family at the bedside is essential to keeping them calm. They know best how to work with the patients and what they need. Um, they can be a voice for them as well. And so those are all very effective methods that we see um, be really efficient. And yet um, there are times when people still have just a baseline anxiety. And sedation isn't bad. There is an appropriate use for sedation. There are appropriate indicator, indications for it. Um, and so what we love to do in those cases is low-dose clonopin, like 0.25 down the feeding tube, TID, okay. and it depends on the, their benzodiazepine exposure. Um, and we can titrate up from there. Um, low-dose gabapentin, mm -hmm. a little bit of Presidex. But the goal is always for a RAS of zero. We don't want anyone negative one, negative two, let alone negative four. We want them to stay clear of delirium, be active during the day so they can get real sleep at night. And again, to prevent the delirium that causes all the trauma. So you're, um, you're using these acronyms for scales that you guys utilize in your ICU. We didn't use those. Can, so can you uh, explain that a little bit in detail? Yeah, the RAS is the Richmond Agitation Scale. It tells us how agitated someone is or how sedated they are. So a zero is just calm, awake, um, responsive, but not anxious. A one is a little bit anxious and you go up to, I think, a three or a four where they are just a bucking rodeo. On the other side, you can go to a negative one, which is where they're pretty drowsy, but you can still wake them up down to a negative four where you can give them all the painful stimulation and they don't move. Okay. So, um, that helps us say to document and communicate to each other where exactly they are and their arousability. Absolutely. So um, in one of the episodes, you were discussing a, a mentally delayed, um, physically and mentally, it sounded like, delayed um, Down syndrome adult. And I think you said he was a developmentally, maybe a two-year-old, and he used rocking in his coping and you guys allowed him to rock in his bed in the ICU while intubated. Yeah, I was so proud and touched by, by this team because I think um, in other environments where I've worked, someone like that um, coming in with mycoplasma pneumonia, which is a really tenacious pneumonia, it can be a long course, yeah. um, they would automatically say, you know, he's not gonna be able to cope with this, we have to sedate him. Okay. Yet they looked at him and they said, you know, he's, he's has Down syndrome. He has low muscle tone. Mm -hmm. So we do not want him getting weak because if he ends up weak on this ventilator, he's going to end up with a trach, which hardly anyone ever gets trached in our walk-in ICU because they are able to wean off the ventilator because they're strong. So we mm -hmm. wanted that for him. He had a cognitive level of a two-year-old. Sedation causes cognitive deficits. We're now coming up with a... Um, a a diagnosis called post-ICU dementia. Mm, right. What would post-ICU dementia mean for an adult at a two-year-old cognitive level? Does it mean that he's not going to be able to feed himself, use a bathroom, communicate basic needs to his parents? I mean, that would be extremely life-altering for him and his family. And then yeah. we know that sedation causes PTSD. Do we want a kid with aut or an adult with autism and down syndrome to be having hallucinations with all these sensory sensitivities. So they were desperate to do anything to keep him awake and moving. And so he actually ended up being great. As long as he had his toys, his music, his cartoons, and his parents at the bedside, um, he was he was happy. He didn't understand that too, but he wasn't trying to pull it out the whole time and agitated. You just had to keep him engaged, distracted, a hand to hold, but it wasn't pitting him down. It wasn't anything aggressive. And because of his autism, when he was happy, he rocked. When he was anxious, he rocked. And we allowed him to be himself, do his thing. We relied on his baseline lifestyle coping mechanisms that he uses. So he loves to cross his legs. So he'd sit in the bed with his legs crossed. He loves to, to stop when he's walking, sit down and cross his legs. So on the ventilator, we're walking. He stops, crosses his legs. Everyone knows that's just the way he rolls. So we sit and wait. And he did great. And he, was, he walked out of there. It's so incredible. Um, a viewer asked if you guys have uh, patient care techs or nurses aides or techs in your unit. Oh yeah, those are, are essential. We have 
at least one during the day for the 13 patients. Um, and they, yeah, they, they help so, so much. I don't, can't understand why an IC wouldn't provide those. Um, I have a, a sweet picture of a, of a patient that had been, she'd come in from an outside facility and she was, um, she just had gotten off septic shock, um, alcohol withdrawal. She had necrotizing pneumonia um, and some ARDS brewing at the same time. And she was extremely delirious because she'd been sedated for days, mm -hmm. as well as all the other risk right. factors that she had for delirium. So her hair was just a matted mess in the back. Um, and the first time we walked her, I hope maybe I'll post a video of it. She, I mean, the walk was not pretty. She could barely put one foot in front of the other because she was so deconditioned um, and so delirious. And yet they hustled her. And when she took a break in a wheelchair in the hallway, one of our techs just instinctively started brushing her hair out. Mm -hmm. And I was so touched that she was a very difficult patient, extremely anxious, extremely wild, really hard to walk the first time or two. And yet we still tried to create a humane um, environment for her and keep her human by brushing her hair out. But I just don't see that being very feasible when you have four to one staffing ratios and no techs. Um, and yet this patient specifically, I mean, she was 32. The outside hospital had written her off and said she's not going to survive. They were bringing in palliative care consultations. So family requested that she be transferred. Um, and she was, when, when she first walked, she had a peep of 16, I think, and 70%. Mm -hmm. um, and they were wanting to transfer her to send her to, to maybe be in a facility that had ECMO. And the nurse that had her on literally threw her hands on the table, said, no, if you send her to that facility, she will spend another week not walking before she hits the point of ECMO. And then what are they going to do with her? And she was just rage. And so it was this nurse that grabbed the physical therapist and said, we are getting her out of bed. And they they put a gate belt on her and they, they almost just carried her and let her put whatever weight she could out. I was just so touched because that would not have happened otherwise. I mean, she was so anxious, so wild and delirious. After that walk, she calmed down. She was exhausted. They That's turned it. that Presidex way down afterwards because she was, she was zonked. And so that was, to me, was such a good example of how effective walking is for anxiety and delirium by the next day her delirium was so much better almost completely cleared out yet her lungs got worse so she ended up um walking a peep of 18 100 we tried to prone her twice mm -hmm. and she did better walking than proned her oxygenation improved while walking and it did not improve when proned that's incredible so when I was discussing this with my husband after I first found your podcast and I'm listening to all the binge listening to these episodes and I tell him <laughs> if I've ever intubated, I don't want to be sedated. And he's like, well, I do. Let's go ahead and sedate me. We're fine. So then we talk more about the evidence based research behind it and the deconditioning and all of that. And after a few minutes of chatting, he's not medical, by the way, he said, yeah. well, I guess that I, he agreed that life after the illness was more important to focus on than that of that moment in time. And if you really think about it, you're lengthening that time on the ventilator, most likely, if you're sedated versus awake and able to help yourself. So I thought that was really good uh, discussion with my husband. And I just wondered how it sounds like your patients are of the same mindset where they're pretty on board. Yeah, I mean, they haven't done all the research, right? Um, but we can tell them, hey, um, if you want to walk out of here, you got to walk now. I tell my patients, if you stay in bed, that's where you'll stay. But as I think the nurses and the RTs and everyone understand the big picture. Um, the discussion isn't just how do I get through my shift? How do I stop this patient from calling me all the time and being annoying, <laughs> which we've all been there. But it, their discussions are, hey, this person's delirious. What's causing it? How do we fix it? Or mm -hmm. um, sometimes you get hypoactive delirium where they are just comatose. You can't move them. And everyone gets so worried. They're just terrified that that person's going to end up with a trach or they're going to end up going to an LTAC. Like LTAC would be the worst um, disposition for a patient leaving the ICU. And it just makes me laugh because that's so that's pretty normal in most ICUs. But in our ICU, it is... I don't know, a sense of pride, but also deep concern for patients. 
if they walked in, they should walk out. We want them to go back to their lives. They don't just see them as an intubated patient. They see them as a spouse. They see them as their careers, all these things that they want to return them to. And, and I guess when you've seen that success, you expect it, right? So I say the same thing to my husband because one of my biggest fears, if I were to have to be intubated, are the cognitive deficits. The PTSD um, really haunts me as well. <laughs> I almost have PTSD from hearing patients' PTSD. When I see patients that are sedated, we've had to have sedate some of these prone um, and paralyzed COVID patients. Mm-hmm. And I, it's almost like a kid that just found out Santa's not real. Like, I almost wish I believed in Santa still. I wished I believed that sedation was sleep still, because then it would be easier to sedate these patients. But rather, I see them locked into a world of terror. And I don't want that for myself, but it's the cognitive deficits. I feel like my baseline is poor enough. I've got, I'm going to have three kids, three and under. I enjoy my career. If that is taken away from me, that capacity to, to do simple math, to drive a car, to remember what what's going on throughout the week, those kind of tasks that require cognitive function, if that's taken away from me, that will completely affect my quality of life, my identity. So I see that, I think of that for myself, what those things mean for me, what it means for me to be able to get up and wipe my own backside. And that influences how I care for people. I don't want to take away those things that I value from them. I love that. And talk to us about the support of the staff. It sounds like from what you're saying, um, a lot of them are on board and on mission to get these patients from the ICU to walking home. Um, But what about that seasoned ICU nurse that hires on from another facility? How does that transition work? Um, It's a big shock. We have some episodes about it um, from those nurses that came in. Um, Usually... um, a lot of our nurses come in with a lot of med surge experience or even new grads that don't have ICU experience because it is a lot easier to start the clean slate. I was one of those. I didn't have any ICU experience. Um, and they hired me and trained me. So it was just normal. It was it became extremely instinctive to have people awake. I, I mean, I try to talk to my colleagues about it, the nurses that have only worked there. I'm like, what are your memorable moments? How would you teach this? And they don't, they can't even think of it a different way. They're like, well, they're human. So of course they're awake during the day and walking (laughs) and I can't help them see a different perspective because that's all they know. Yet when we have, um, we had a little bit of staffing shortage for a minute. We had travel nurses coming in and some of them were extremely seasoned and we warned them beforehand. One says that we didn't warn her, which I, 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 she had a funny take on it. She, she's walked in and she was just in shock. She was panicked. You walk into the room and the patient's intubated and um, suctioning their own mouths. And the, the <laughs> this travel nurse was terrified, right? Because she thinks that their patient's going to pull their tube out. Um, yet, these are good people with good intentions, good desires, and they're immersed in this culture. Um, and so, for the most part, they, they jump in, they adapt to it. I had a travel nurse say, because uh, that was his first contract. He'd come from Mississippi. He was used to just straight... For said drips on everybody. Everyone got so he comes into this awake and walking ICU, and he's like, "I don't know about this." Then he watched a patient die of delirium that had come from outside facility, had Alzheimer's, had been sedated for ten days. His lung, the lungs had gotten better, but his brain never got better, and the family decided to withdraw care, and he died of of confusion, inability to clear his secretions, and died of delirium. So this travel nurse came to me in tears. And said, I had no idea this is what we were doing to people. What do I do from here? Because I can't work at this hospital forever. I'm going to take other contracts. But how do I now? Now I'm I'm liable for what I know. Now I have this ethical obligation to do what's best for my patients. But it's going to be so hard elsewhere. And all I could say was, I don't know. And so we have some uh, episodes from people that have left our ICU and gone to other places. And the ethical turmoil that they face. One uh, colleague said that he could feel the delirium and smell the rot in the air. And he tries so hard to clear the delirium out. He'll have people in a chair suctioning their their mouth. By the end of the day, he comes on the next shift and they're sedated again. So it is such a deep cultural thing, but it's really interesting to watch these people get it. Um, And so I, I think I deeply believe that all nurses want to do the right thing. They want their patients to get better, but 
we haven't really ha- always had the opportunity to know how. Mm-hmm. But that's why I'm on this rampage is I know that if nurses could see it from patients' perspectives, if they knew that there was a different way and they knew how to do it, all, all nurses need is the opportunity to know and the support to do, and they're going to be inst- unstoppable. Yeah, that's amazing. Can you imagine if all ICU nurses, I mean, I'm, I'm one of those that liked the more pumps, the better, the sicker, the better, sedated. I mean, that's what I loved. It did pick you for 13 years and give me the sickest, stillest patient and we're good. And now yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, wow. And that sounds kind of, I don't know, morbid. But I loved, I really truly loved watching all of these things work together. And it's like this really complex puzzle and you see pieces fitting, you see this patient get better. And sometimes because kids are so resilient, they would walk out of the ICU. Right. But I mean, can you imagine how much shorter that time frame would have been had we not used as much sedation? I mean, now all of these things go through my mind. Like, how could that have been different? Um, so yeah, it's super interesting. And how and you kind of talked about it, but how do you kind of guide those nurses that like the tubes and lines and loss of sedation? How do you guide them to back down a little bit and allow their patients to wake up more? Well, I it's really hard for them to oversedate their patients when we don't even start sedation. So they're coming in, they're getting patients that are already awake and calm and walking. And then, you know, time to walk comes, physical therapy comes in, art respiratory therapy comes in. Um, it's kind of hard for them to say no. <laughs> and that, yeah. that's kind of the difference is when you're already immersed in this supportive system, it kind of happens. So it's it's fun to hear um, one of our, our travel nurses talk on one of the episodes saying I, they just made it easy. I mean, I, I had some questions. I was nervous. And yet um, I saw it happening and I could see the benefits. I saw patients getting better and... I just realized that this is how it should be. So I'm just taking notes now. Um, I did have a, a, just a little bit ago, I have a travel nurse come in and, um, cause we had a patient that was anxious. Um, and they were a COVID patient and they were isolated in the room and it, there are lots of new challenges with that. Yeah. And she was an older nurse and she asked for an out of And I, I mean, most of our staff doesn't even know that that exists or that was ever a thing. Um, and I, <laughs> my jaw just kind of dropped for a second, took me a minute. But all I could say was, who's going to clean up that mess? And she said, what? And I said, well, who's going to clean up the mess after? You start the drip now, it makes your shift easier. But it's like biting off the top of a grenade and handing it down to the next shift. And every day the grenade is going to get bigger and bigger and it's going to explode on somebody when somebody has to turn that off. And you're going to unleash the whole storm of delirium that's been happening for days, but it's just easier when it's not on your shift that you have to wake them up. Um, But she was just was taken back. Like she'd never looked at the big picture. It was like, Hey, they're really squirrely in there. It's annoying. Um, And I'm sure she wanted them to be comfortable and they look more comfortable when they're sedated. Um, Mm -hmm. So even just asking a simple question like, Hey, what, but what does that mean for the patient? Is that Mm -hmm. really helpful? Is that going to really bring out, bring good outcomes? And once we actually think through it and see it from the, the bigger perspective, there's not a whole lot of fighting or discussion left. I mean, I think everyone's on board when they all understand. So these nurses come in and hopefully they're open to learning. If not, they still learn. And I, it's up to them whether or not they continue those practices after. So what do you think needs to change in medicine for us to continue this progression to a week in walking ICUs across the U.S.? What what do you think needs to happen? What are some like big picture ideas? Um, My first impression is that knowledge has to happen first. I hear um, a lot of doctors even still refer to sedation as sleep. And I don't know. I think sometimes it's just habitual. And I think sometimes it's actually just ignorant. Like we just, they just don't know what it's like for patients. I had a, a physician come in from another part of the country um, and he had had lots of experience, so knowledgeable, such a good teacher. But in this aspect of what patients actually endure under sedation and then what life is like after, mm-hmm. he had no clue. And so he referred to it as sleep. And that's a little bit of a trigger for me after all 
talking to all these survivors, I feel like I have to speak up. And so I was like, are you sure about that term? Are you sure that's what you want to use? And he had no idea. And he just looked shocked when I told him about people having PTSD from sedation. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it's going to start with knowledge. I see a lot of um, newer MDs coming out of school with a much more open perspective, um, a bigger understanding of early mobility. They may not um, have the vision of the wake and walking ICU quite yet, but they're open to it. They're not um, from the same generation of benzodiazepine drips and paralytics. Um, I know that they're talking about it in nursing schools. So I've had uh, nursing students reach out being really excited about this. And again, it's easier when they just don't know any other way besides how it should be. Um, So I think knowledge is going to be a baseline. I think administration needs to understand what happens to patients. So when I hear about, you know, especially the the situation in New York and other parts of our country, when we have four to one, 13 to one patients with with a nurse, one nurse, or when physical and occupational therapy are being taken out of the ICU um, with the COVID patients, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And I know PPE is a concern. And as a side note, I wonder if we use less PPE when we get with a little more staff, when we get patients better faster, then less staff and let patients sit in the ICU for longer. For so I think administration time. needs to have that same perspective as well as what are our actual goals? Our goals to just get them out of the hospital or get them back into their lives because it's a whole other expense to have them tra- paid on a ventilator for another 20 days because of weakness right. than it is to have more staff, keep them up and strong. Mm-hmm. And so I think a lot of it's knowledge, culture. We have to understand what's possible, how it should be, patient perspective, develop those skills of actually talking to patients working them through the anxiety, understanding delirium, how to work through delirium, how to prevent it. And then the support of having enough staff to facilitate these things. But I think with normal staffing ratios of two to one, having PT and OT there, enough RTs, it's, we're able to keep patients strong. So it's not using lifts. It's not huge, flaccid, newborn adults that we're trying to move at once. If we focus on preventing the harm, then it's going to be so much easier to treat them and keep them strong. Absolutely. And, you know, um, insurance has really been a stickler on us as healthcare providers about preventing hospital acquired pneumonias and infections and all the things. And they say, you know, well, if if it happened in the hospital, if it acquired in the hospital, then we're not going to pay for it. Um, I saw you mention something about that referencing that uh, Medicaid payback, Medicare, Medicaid insurance payback. Um, tell us about that and what your thoughts are. Uh, yeah, I just had to put a post out. It was just amusing. Um, but it, I mean, so much financial cost has occurred from hospital acquired weakness. And we have so much emphasis and so many protocols and things built into preventing hospital acquired harm, such as pressure ulcers, um, infections, everything that you mentioned. So what would change in our system if we were as concerned about hospital acquired weakness as we are about hospital acquired infections? Mm -hmm. How would that change? And then I would love to know how much money would we save if we kept people's capacity to care for themselves while they're throughout their hospitalizations, they can actually go back to their lives. Um, One of the episodes on the podcast is from, is with a nurse practitioner that um, had gone to LTAC. She'd she'd been in the RICU, learned that culture, that protocol, then went to LTAC and they were not interested in getting people off of their narcotics and benzodiazepines. They did not want them awake and moving throughout the day. That's LTAC. And she realized that that wasn't a good fit for her because she was more interested in getting people better. And she actually got in trouble because she was getting people discharged before their 30 days were up. Um, And so so then the facilities weren't getting the full 30-day reimbursement. So something has to change in our incentives uh, within our system. We should be, again, we should be rewarded for good outcomes and not looking to incur more... um, be able to charge more for more time in the hospital that we caused by neglect. Um, That same nurse practitioner started her own respiratory um, rehab unit kind of in a, in SNFs. 
Wow. And so she gets a lot of patients that are um, that have already failed LTAX, meaning they've passed their 30 days and they're still not decannulated. They're still ventilator dependent, still extremely weak. And most of these people have come out of ICUs. And in those kind of units, she said that um, the decannulation rate was about, I think she said something between 13 and 15%. Mm -hmm. And her units that she created, they're about 60%. 50 wow. to 60% of those patients are decannulated off the ventilators and going home Definitely. because she implemented the same process as the awake and walking, walking ICU. So all of these things, financially, our focus, patient quality of life, it is all dependent on what our focus is. If we're focusing on just getting through the shift, then that's all that's going to happen. If we focus on getting people their lives back, things have to change. Yeah. So um, something we didn't mention, but I'm actually really curious, when you have a patient on uh, cardiac pressors, what does that look like? Do you guys get them up and walking? And when they're needing cardiac pressors, um, I would assume that if they're up and walking, they're going to need them for less time. What does that look like? Yeah, that is a great question because... Um... Not everyone's going to be out jumping, doing jumping jacks on the ventilator and walking 200 feet. Um, and yeah. the great thing about this process, when you don't just automatically sedate everyone that's on a ventilator, then you can personalize and customize their care to what they're capable of, what their status is. So let's say we get a, a patient in um, septic shock. When they're in those early stages and they are... Um, just leaking fluid like crazy and you're not common and you're slamming fluid in, they're going to be intervascularly dry and maybe not super tolerant of um, a lot of uh, activity. Sure. But you don't know until you try. So what's the harm in sitting them up at the side of the bed, asking right. them how they feel, checking their hemodynamics, do you feel lightheaded, um, seeing if their respiratory status changes, if their heart rate changes, blood pressure changes, stand them. See how they do. Um, back in the day, we used to only use a pulse ox, but now we have cardi or we have monitors that can detach from the main monitor, and we can carry right. that along with us. We can have a wheelchair behind us. If they feel lightheaded, have these symptoms, then we can stop. So if someone's on two, three pressers, we're not going to be throwing them out of bed. Sure. But if someone's on just norepinephrine um, and their dose isn't really changing a lot, then what is the harm in seeing what they can do? We have had no adverse events. Um, that was one of the big parts of that study 13 years ago is that nothing bad happened. So in some of these studies, so so we're kind of talking about hemodynamics there, right? Another part yeah. of walking is pulmonary function. Um, I think we get really concerned when people are, are on high vent settings, and that is completely a just, justifiable concern. Um, when I look through the research, the only guidelines that are really uh, out there that are published are things like um, one article mentioned that patients should not even be dangled um, until their FiO2 needs are less than 60 and PEEP is less than eight. Yet, if you look at the methodology um, of how that came to be, who created that, how was that proven? It was a group of um, like five intensivists. I can't remember how many. It was a group of intensivists, a lot more physical therapists, and one nurse in the UK. They got together, discussed what they'd feel comfortable with. Once it came, came to a consensus, that's what they published. That wasn't any proven data. That wasn't actual research. That was just an article that they published. Um, but you can't research what you don't do. So when we talk about what are what vent settings are too high to walk on, I think it depends on what the patient tolerates. So we have patients walking on, like I mentioned, a peep of 16 to 20. Um, we always bump everyone up to 100%. You think about okay. on the floor, you have a patient on two liters nasal cannula, maybe they need six liters to walk. What's the harm in increasing the oxygen, pre-oxygenating them, standing them up, seeing how they feel, seeing how their work of breathing is, keeping the pulse ox on them. We have a wheelchair behind them if they need it. They can stop, take breaks, recover. If they're not tolerant, it, we roll them back to the to the bed. I mean, no, no adverse events have happened. If anything, their pulmonary function improves. They oxygenate better. They mobilize secretions. Yeah. Their respiratory muscles stay strong so they can actually wean off the ventilator. Um, a lot of times their um, ventilator needs decrease in the following hours after a walk. Mm -hmm. 
So we're so afraid. We look at these numbers and we just think, oh, we can't move them. We can't touch them. Um, when really movement is medicine. Um, I think brain also is a big part. Um, we had a, a nurse filling in from another unit and said, oh, well, told the physical therapist, she's, she's too confused. She didn't sleep well last night. She's not really, really with it. And so the physical therapist came to me and said, I, I'm, I'm confused because we always try to walk as, or move as much as possible people that are delirious. Sometimes people are so delirious, they can't even put one foot in front of the other. We've all seen it, right? But it's amazing to watch even those patients when you sit them up at the side of the bed and make them hold their own heads up, engage their trunk. One, that's preventing more deconditioning. And two, their brains start to turn on. And mm -hmm. so it's part of our assessment. It becomes instinctive. When we look at a patient and say, can they walk? Um, we don't know until we try, but as we start advancing the process, we're evaluating all those parts of their function and making sure that it's safe. That's awesome. I don't know if that answers your question, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you did. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, it depends on the patient, really. And that's the big picture is if you're not assessing them and like those of us who are used to a sedated ICU, you specifically like no, they don't walk because they're sedated and paralyzed, and that's what you chart. And so, if they're not sedated and paralyzed, um, you know, you didn't try, so you can't say that they can't walk, right? And I love that. If you don't try, then you don't know. So, I want you to tell and, us a little and we bit say, about we say they're too sick to walk. But what if we say this? There's too yeah. sick to walk, but really, we've made them too weak to walk. There is such a difference. And so if we prevent the weakness, they hardly ever become too sick to walk. Yet there are times when they can take a break, when they need to be prone or paralyzed, or they get even sicker, they're not hemodynamically stable. But yet we didn't waste all those that time, those hours, those days before that point. We didn't let them rot beforehand. So Absolutely. then they're able to recover once that acute illness um, is resolved. Absolutely. I am hands down. I am. I'm with you. I'm I'm super on <laughs> board with this. I'm so excited. It's um, so encouraging. I knew people would care about this. I knew that nurses would want to know. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't wait until more people get to watch the Q&A that we've done since it didn't work out earlier and they are going to get to <laughs> actually see what they were waiting to see all day. So I'm super excited for them to tune in too. Um, you've talked about some patients that you've done interviews with on your podcast, some nurses. Uh, tell us more about what your podcast, like overall umbrella, what are you doing in there? Um, I'm just winging it. I don't really know what I'm doing yet. I'm just doing what feels right. So <laughs> I, I felt, um, uh, as a travel nurse, I would try to talk to people about this. Um, I, but I, I didn't even know enough to know how to engage in the conversation. I, it would go like this. I'd say, um, why is the patient sedated? And they'd look at me like I was crazy and say, because they're intubated. And I'd say, but I know, but why are they sedated? And they, it, we just go in circles. And so I, I found like I, I found that there was a huge lack of knowledge on my part as well as other people's. Um, and then when I went to grad school, I could feel that part of my calling would be to disseminate this, that this needed to go beyond this little tertiary hospital ICU and be standard and that people would grasp onto it. Yeah. So I thought, what, am I supposed to go get a PhD and do research? But in reality, there is so much research out there. There are about 10 years worth of research validating all of this, but we don't apply it. We don't use it. A lot of us are unaware of it. It just it doesn't mean anything until it's people. And so one day I was um, on an airplane, and this is while I was in grad school. I still didn't know what it was like for patients. And um, I sat next to a survivor who told me about his time in the ICU being sedated and his insomnia. I mentioned it in the podcast, but it ruined his life. And at, in his late 40s, he was a DNR denied because he never wanted to go through that again. And that, the part that he didn't want to go through again, was the sedation, the PTSD, the images, the hallucinations, the delirium. Hmm. And that hit me. I thought, does, does anyone else know this? Any, I know nurses don't want this to happen to people. Wow. And when I talk to nurses around the country, they say, well, we get sedation so that they just sleep through it, so they don't remember anything, so that, um, so that they don't get PTSD. So we have this opposite understanding of what's really going on. Wow. So I kept on having this itch 
to tell people, all the good nurses out there, what is going on. And so one day it just hit me. I didn't even really listen to podcasts. It just hit me, start a podcast. And so I just got a microphone and I went on to um, survivor pages and I asked questions and I found people telling stories and I just found these incredible survivors. Like one, one of them, um, Susan East, she's a three-time ARDS survivor. After her first time with ARDS, she went to an attorney and had legal documents drafted protecting her against sedation. She has an incredible interview. So, so they've made it easy for me. I just, the right people have come out of the word work. It's not hard to find people that have been completely traumatized and had their lives altered by what we do in the ICU. And then I work with these amazing colleagues that have so much to offer. And so I just, all I do is push record, ask them questions and let them teach it. It's been incredibly educational for me. Um, And it's exciting to see other people care about it and be excited about it. Um, I just, I know that some of these seasoned nurses are like, that's annoying. It's not going to happen. It's not feasible. I toured an ICU in another state a couple of months ago and the medical director said, yeah, there's, there's research out there about that, but good luck getting that done here. Our nurses won't do that. And Ooh, it fired me up. Anyone that says, and it's a common thing that physicians will say, they'll, they'll pass it to the nurses. They'll say they won't do it. And I don't believe that because I know that nurses don't understand what it's like for patients. And if they did, they would change it. And if administration knew, they would support them. If doctors really knew, they would support them. So it's not that no one won't do it. It's that they have not had the opportunity to know how it should be done. So that's how the podcast has come to be. Um, I have so many more episodes coming out. Um, I'm excited about it. I want to know what your questions are. So contact me on the Facebook page for the, um, for the podcast. Ask me your questions. If you know people that should be interviewed, ideas, feedback, all of it. Again, I don't know what I'm doing here. So guide me, tell me what you want to know, and we'll make it happen. That's amazing. If you haven't tuned into Kaylee's podcast, it really is eye-opening. It's really enlightening. It's really amazing to see I mean, advancing in medicine, even though it's been around since the 90s, like, I didn't know. And I was also a travel nurse, but it was in the PICU. So I think there is some, you know, different challenges there. But I don't think that it's um, impossible. I really don't. So just I've seen videos of kids playing with their toys on the ventilator. I've got to track down whoever does it. We've got to talk about it. So if anyone knows of anyone that does that process hit me up. They've got stuff to teach us. And I've I've seen trached kids, but not, not intubated. So we had trached kids up and playing, of course, but um, yeah, so for sure, like that, that whole process, there's a wake in walking pediatric ICU. Like I, I can't wait to hear that podcast and talk to those people too. (laughs) So cool. So in closing, could you just tell us what you're most excited about in your career? I'm excited to watch this unroll throughout the country. It's um, my colleagues that have started this. That was always their vision. And now they're at the end of their careers. And I feel responsible for carrying on their legacy because this would not have been created without them, without a nurse with vision. And I'm excited to watch nurses take control, take the reins and do what their instincts tell them, which is the best thing for the patients. Um, I am 30 years old. We've still got time. and I expect to see that happen throughout my career. I want this kind of process to be standard within the next five to 10 years. I don't know if I have a lot of control over that, but I know that spreading the word is going to be a huge part of that and people will act on the good things that they learn. Absolutely. We have viewers that are super excited to tune into your podcast, guys. The link is in the the post there. Um, Just open the text. It's there. There's a link so you can find it. And um, people are saying that they would wish that they could be trained by you and that they're so appreciative of the time (laughs) you're putting into this. So thank you for your time, Kaylee. Thank you for the dedication to um, advancing this concept of awake and walking ICU. And thank you so much for taking the time to educate us and get the word out. Well, I'm excited to work with all of you, whether in person or online. I think the more collaboration, the better. Go team. Go team. Have a good night. (laughs) Thanks so much. Talk to you guys later. Bye.